Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Samuel. So Tonight we'll start in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 26. And Lord willing, we'll make it down to the 20th verse of chapter 13. Ambitious plan for tonight. What we see here in the end of chapter 12, uh, having spent several sessions on David's great sin, uh, we now um, take care of some unfinished business, if you will. Uh, This passage of Scripture at the end of chapter 12 deals with Israel's victory over the Ammonites, a a victory over uh, them uh, in a war that was started uh, some time back. If you look back at chapter um, 11 and verse 1, maybe you remember there, it says, And it came to pass after the year was was ended, uh, the word expired really means ended, uh, at the time when kings go forth to battle, the spring, we talked about then, was a time when uh, kings went off to war because along the way they could, they could pick up um, supplies through farms and, and various means, and it was much more abundant in the springtime than it was in the cold winter. So the spring was when they went out to war. That David sent jo- Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, Rabbah is the capital city of uh, Ammon, about 25 miles um, east of the Jordan, uh, just opposite Jericho. But David tarried still at Jerusalem, and we know what kind of problems happened because David stayed there instead of going out to war. We're not going to go over that again at this point. But but this is a this. Keep in mind that when. And so at the, at the beginning of chapter 11, we went away from that war with the Ammonites that Israel was having, and we looked at David's great sin. And now we come at the end of chapter 12 to get back to that war. Now this war was actually begun earlier than that. If you look back in chapter 10 and verse 14, uh, you'll see, And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, Then fled they also before uh, Abishai and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. So it was Abishai there in chapter 10 and verse 14 that was fighting against the Ammonites out in the open fields. And uh, when they saw the Syrians had fled, and that was a made-up army, they hired uh, soldiers from surrounding areas Uh, And when they saw the Syrian and that great army uh, fall at the hands of of Joab, those Ammonites that were fighting against Abishai, they decided to flee back into their town in Rabbah. That's when we pick it up in chapter 11 and verse 1 when it says that after the year was ended and the springtime when it was time to go back out to battle, that's when uh, Joab went out to fight against the Ammonites again. Uh, This time over to the city of Rabbah where they had retreated after the pushback of Abishai. Now David didn't go with them, and that was a problem, and we've seen that. So we go to chapter 12 and verse 26, and now we pick up this battle again. The Israelites fighting against the Ammonites. And in verse 26 of chapter 12, Joab and Joab fought against Rabbah, of the children of Ammon, and took the royal city. Now, Rabbah being the capital there, it's called the royal city here. And um, it also says in verse 27 that Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have taken the city of waters, literally had taken their water supply from them. And so now... um, uh, what we find is in verse 28, Now therefore gather... This is the message that Joab sent from the battlefield in Rabbah over to David. And in Jerusalem it says, Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it. 
lest I take the city. That is, in order to prevent the chance that I take the city and the city be called after my name. Um, So Joab was doing the thing that he should have done and deferring to the king. The king should have been out there to start with, but David wasn't. So when it got time to, to make the conquest of the Ammonites, Joab sent word to David, you might want to come out here and finish this thing up. So in verse 29, that's what David does. He gathers all the people together, went to Rabbah, and fought against it and took it. So in verse 30, what we find is the spoil that he took, and he took their king's crown from his head, the weight of which was a talent of gold. If you don't know how much that weighs, it's about 75 to 100 pounds. That's just the crown that the king wore. Uh, And it says, with the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. So David being the victor, if you will, and Joab had said, David, come on out and and win the victory here. It's it's ready uh, to be had. And so it was set on David's head, and he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. They took of the Ammonites out of their cities uh, and, and brought it back to Jerusalem and to other areas in Israel. And so in verse 31, what we see there is the servitude that David placed the Ammonites under. If you remember, back in chapter 10, when we talked about all of those areas, we drew it on the map uh, here in our study, that uh, David, in each of those cases, had them serve Israel. He does the same thing here, having now taken the Ammonites in verse 31 of chapter 12, and he brought forth the people who were in it, and put them uh, to labor with saws and with harrows of iron and with axes of iron, uh, and made them pass through the brick kiln. Thus did he unto all the cities of the children of Ammon, so David and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. Now, there's a little controversy uh, in the interpretation of this verse 31. Uh, Some say that David put them to hard forced labor, Others say that they were just put to servitude. Uh, And in the King James, uh, we find that it takes the former position, that is that the King James translators have interpreted it to mean that they were put into hard forced labor. And it comes from these three italicized words, them to labor. Um, And if you remember... As we've said many times, italicized words in the King James are not directly translated from the original manuscripts. They're added words by the translators to try to make sense of what they translated. Um, Because in the original Hebrew and Aramaic, in Hebrew particularly, there were no vowels. So words could could be uh, interpreted in a couple of different ways. And so here, the King James translators indicate that they were put to labor, meaning that they were literally put to hard forced labor. That's the interpretation they give it. Uh, In in, uh, other interpretations, for instance, in the New King James Version, it's more of a a servitude than hard forced labor. So anyway, um, they were put into um, a position of serving Israel as all the other surrounding countries were put in. Ammon was sort of the last of those Uh, And here we see them being captured. And so this is the tidying up of some unfinished business from before. Now I want to spend most of the time in chapter 13. Um, Chapter 13, these first 20 verses, I call them Amnon's Passion. Now Amnon is not the same as Ammon. Ammon is the country. Amnon is one of David's sons. Uh, And Amnon's Passion... I chose the word passion because passion refers to sexual or sensual lust. And that's exactly what we have here. The interesting thing is that what we find in the life of Amnon, David's son, is a direct reflection of what we found in David as he walked around on the rooftop and looked on Bathsheba. We find almost the exact same circumstances. Uh, as far as the beginning of that lust uh, is concerned. Now, um, in the first uh, two verses here, uh, this is Amnon's desire, we'll call it. Now, let's read these two verses, and I want to refer back uh, to the previous chapter for a moment. 
But in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, verses 1 and 2, And it came to pass after this, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so um, vexed that he fell sick for his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. Now, uh, what we're going to find here is, is the beginning. In fact, this, from chapter 13 all the way through chapter 20, we find the fulfillment of the verses back in chapter 12, verses 10 to 12. Let's look back at that. After David, David's sin was pointed out to him by Nathan, Nathan makes this pronouncement upon David in 2 Samuel 10, excuse me, 2 Samuel 12 and verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, he's speaking for the Lord, right? And hast taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. We're going to see that begin right here in chapter 13. God didn't waste any time getting to it. But it says there that, I, that God is going to raise up evil. The word means bad or trouble. Going to be trouble right in your own house, David, because of your sin. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And now we'll see that in chapter 16 as we go on. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight uh, of the son. For thou, why? For thou didst it secretly... David's sin, he tried to cover it up. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Now what we see in, in chapter 13 is Amnon being the first of the family where there's serious trouble. And it, there's real trouble here. There's no question about it. Now what happens here, and I call these first two verses Amnon's desire. Amnon's desire. He had a lustful desire for his sister. And some will say, well, you know, it's a half-sister. Because after all, um, uh, it says here, um, it came to pass that Absalom, now his, Absalom's mother was Maaca, M-A-A-C-A-H. And that's, in, that's I'm not going to turn there, but I can find that in chapter 3, in verses 2 and 3. Uh, and Absal Absalom was the son of David, but his mother was Maaca. And he had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. Tamar's mother was the same as Absalom's, Maacah. They had the same mother and same father. Absalom and Tamar were brother and sister. And it says, and Amnon, Amnon's mother was a Ahinoam. Uh, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her, loved who? Tamar. So Tamar was a child of David. So was Amnon. They had different mothers. But let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 18 to look at the principle before we get into the, into the depth of the study here. You say, well, you know, there's a half-sister there. They're not really brother and sister. Yeah, they are. And it's, uh, it's spelled out very plainly in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 11 as the law was given by God. It says, The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter. <clears throat> so who was Amnon's father? David. Uh, who, was, um, who was David's wife? Uh, Maaca. In other words, Amnon was uh, Ahinoam, but Tamar was of uh, Maaca. But it was still one of his father's wives, right? So the, na the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, that's Tamar. David's wife's daughter is called Tamar. It's not the only one, but that is one of them. So the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, that's David in our case, she is thy sister. Your half-sister is your sister. And it says, Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. 
uncover the nakedness is a phrase that is used for a sexual relations. You shall not have sexual relations with your sister, even though she be a half-sister. It's against God's law to do that. So we go back over to our text. Who is this that Amnon has a lust for? It's his half-sister. Inasmuch as you've thought to do it in your heart, you've already done it. So he's looked on Tamar just like David looked on Bathsheba. There's not really any difference. It was a sexual lust, a sensual lust that is at the root of both of these. Because of David's sin, Amnon's doing the same thing. And you know, there and, and we look at it and say, well, innocent lives just get all wrapped up in this. There's a consequence for sin. There's a consequence for sin. Now, if this hadn't been recorded in the scriptures, to get back to what we talked about last week, do you think David would have ever figured out that his sin caused Amnon to lust after Tamar. You see what I'm getting at? I don't think that we'd have put it together. But God tells us that's the case. And uh, there is a consequence. And we're going to see this thing. It actually causes a lot of trouble. Not just a little bit. This thing is worse than any soap opera you could watch. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding you. You can sit there and and uh, and scour the TV channels and try to find something that's more that's worse, but I don't think you're going to find it. Not that I've seen them all and know it all, because I don't <laughs> take my word for that. So anyway, so he lusted after her in verse two of chapter thirteen, and Amnon was he was so vexed. The word means frustrated or distressed. He was so frustrated that he fell sick, literally fell sick to the point of illness, because his lust for his sister was so strong. It's just the beginning. It says that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. And so rightfully she's called his sister here, according to Leviticus 18.11. So it says, For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. Man, he just wanted her so bad, he got sick over it. You ever wanted something so bad, you got sick over it? That's where he is. So now that's his desire. Now let's take a look at his deception. Amnon's deception in verses 3 through 6. So he put a plan. It's just like David put a deceptive plan in place to cover up his sin. Amnon does the same thing. It says, but Amnon had a friend. It's really a cousin, by the way. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. So if it's the son of David's brother, then it's a cousin, first cousin. So Jonadab was, um, was Amnon's first cousin and called a friend here. And Jonadab was a very, very subtle man. Do you know who else was subtle? The devil. <laughs> the devil was the, was the beginning of subtlety. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, in the very beginning there. So, so Amnon had this, had this cousin, and he was a very deceptive person. Uh, he was very shrewd, um, much like the devil is, because he's fueled by the devil. So in verse 4, And he, that is Jonadab, said unto him, that is unto Amnon, uh, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Why is it you're not putting any weight on, Amnon? I mean, you ought to be a pretty healthy fella. There's no shortage of food at the king's table, and I know that. This is the king's brother's son speaking, right? You ought to, you ought to have some meat on those bones, Amnon, but you're running around here like you... Like you're not getting enough to eat. So in the middle of verse 4, Wilt thou not tell me? Tell me what's going on. And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. See, he doesn't call her his sister. He calls her his brother's sister. 
right from the very beginning, he already fabricates a lie uh, that, that sort of sets the stage that it might be okay to do it. So Jonadab, not just being a cousin, but being a friend of Amnon, he wants to help him. So Jonadab said unto Amnon in verse 5, Lay thee down on thy bed um, and make thyself sick. <laughs> How do you make yourself sick? Just lay down on your bed. Okay, I'm going to be sick. No, you have to feign sickness. You have to pretend to be sick. And oh, by the way, uh, Jonadab noticed one thing about him that would, that would be helpful to him to, to, to um, begin this deception. And that is, he seemed to be a very weakly fellow for being of the king's family. So just his frailty alone, his physical frailty, would lead one to believe that maybe he's not very well. So he says... Uh, uh, pretend that you're sick. Make yourself pretend you're sick. And when thy father cometh, that is when David comes to see you, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and address the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So what's the suggestion that uh, Amnon's friend has, his cousin? Uh, Ask your dad to send Tamar in and actually to prepare the food in front of you. That way you get to spend some time with her. And oh, by the way, what's going to end up happening is this sets the stage for him to have alone time with her, which was forbidden to have alone time with the virgin. So, uh, in verse 6, um, Amnon doesn't waste any time. So Amnon lay down, and he pretended he was sick. He made himself sick. He did it. He took his friend's advice. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, talking to David, let Tamar, my sister, now he calls, him, calls her his sister, uh, because his friend called her that, uh, come and make me a couple of cakes, that's bread, in my sight, that I may eat at her hand. Oh, I'm so sick, Dad. You know, this is what I really need. If you want to help me, uh, send Tamar in here to make me some food. Seems very innocent, doesn't it? Uh, it's a deceptive plan to fulfill his sexual lust. Now, in verses 7 to 14, I call this Amnon's depravity. Literally, his perversion, his corruption, his evil, his sin. Just like David. David had lust. David set a deceptive plan in place to cover it up after he had committed sin. Amnon's doing the same thing. So we find in verse 7, Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. Uh, the wording there means dress his meat. That means to prepare the food. So Tamar, in verse 8, went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down. Oh, imagine that. And she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes or bread in his sight and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. That's interesting. And Amnon said, <laughs> refusing to eat, he said, Have uh, or send out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. Now, he wasn't supposed to be alone with the lady. No, no. Big no, no. But in order to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, he had to send them all out. Then it's just him and Tamar. So in verse 10, Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the bread or the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. I mean, even the thought of that is sickening. It's incest. It's incest, strictly forbidden by God's word. But that's why I called it Amnon's depravity. Literally, depraved. Uh, evil, wicked sin. Um, and uh, he, he ends up corrupting not only himself, but his sister as well in the process. So he says, come lie with me. 
See, she brought him the bread and he grabbed her. He didn't want the bread. What he wanted was her. It was all a deceptive plan to start with. So in verse 12, she answered him and said, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Uh, the thing here is a wicked thing is what she's talking about. She said, do not vow this folly. And it's because of the passage we know in the law that we read in Leviticus 18 and verse 11. And we also know that um, uh, this is something that would, uh, that would disqualify Amnon from the throne, being of the line of David. It's something that would cause um, all of the people in Israel to look at him as if he has an immoral character. And that he is, um, that he's a wicked person, that he's perverted uh, and corrupt. And that's why uh, she says there, um, no such thing, no such wicked thing, literally ought to be done in Israel. Don't do this folly. And she calls it folly. And folly there doesn't mean foolishness. It means something that's vile. And it means something that's related to being villainous. He's the villain here. He's a perpetrator. And that's what it really means. So don't do, although it is foolishness to act in such a manner, it has a, a, a stricter meaning than that. So in verse 13, and I, whither uh, shall I cause my shame to go? So Tamar says, you know, how am I going to get rid of my shame? You're going to put me to shame. Because they're in the chamber alone. And who's going to believe her? Who's going to believe her? So she sees her personal ruin coming out of this. That he's going to force her to have sexual relations. He's going to rape her. And she's saying, you ought not to do this thing. There's no place to hide for me. I've got no place to hide. My life is going to be shamed from here on out. I'm going to be known as a fornicator. Because you're going to paint the picture that way. Isn't that what happens? You see all these rape cases go before the courts, and the first thing everybody does is they look at the woman, who's usually the target, and they say, well, you know, did she bring it on? Did she lead them on? Why do we always immediately question the integrity of the woman when she makes an accusation? Understanding that all, all cases that are claimed to be rape are not rape. But we immediately don't believe the woman we believe the man. Oh, I didn't do it. Okay, now let's prove it here. So it's a man and a woman alone. How are you going to prove it? And that's really where she's going to. I can't prove this thing. I'm going to be known as a fornicator. And she may even have in mind that maybe she'll get pregnant from this sexual relation. And that's going to bring shame on her to have a baby out of wedlock in that day. Yeah, we've lost our shame around that today. But well, it was certainly taboo in those days. So, where shall I cause my shame to go, she says. And then, she says, as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. You're going to be wicked and immoral. Uh, you're, you're going to give up your rights to the throne and all of that stuff. You're literally going to be seen as a fool who has rejected God. Because the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So it says, um, as for you, you're going to be like one of the foolish people in Israel, like the heathen. So she says, now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Now she's referring to marriage here. Speak unto David. Now, she's really getting desperate at this point, and this is really her last ditch effort to try to get, because no doubt... Amnon still got her in his clutches. And she's trying everything she can to get away from him. She's trying to reason with him, and that's not working. So then she, she uses this thing called marriage, and the, a marriage between the two of them would be forbidden. It wouldn't be a legal marriage. And no doubt she knows that. But she also knows that she's about to be the target of a rape, and that's not legal either. <laughs> So she's really trying to fend for herself. It doesn't mean that she's, she's right in suggesting that, but it's another ploy because she's so desperate to avoid this 
this uh, rape. Howbeit, in verse 14, he would not hearken under a voice. He wouldn't listen. He had his mind made up from verse 1. It says at the end of verse 1, he loved her. Literally, he lusted after her. She couldn't say anything to stop it. It's like when David sent to inquire who Bathsheba was. Didn't know who she was. Who's she? That's Uriah's wife. Bring her on in. No doubt had a plan from the very beginning, knowing who she was, that I can, I can perpetrate a, uh, orchestrate a plan here so that I can cover all this stuff up. Well, no doubt Amnon's got a plan that there are no witnesses. There are no witnesses. He's got a plan. He's got a plan. He wouldn't listen, but in the middle of verse 14, being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Literally raped her. Literally raped her. That's uh, Amnon's depravity. Now, um, verses 15 to 20 will turn our attention to what I call Tamar's desolation. Tamar's desolation. What we find here, beginning with verse 15, is a sad story on Tamar's part. She tried everything. She wasn't strong enough to escape from Amnon's grip. She wasn't strong enough. Uh, the king sent her in there under false pretenses on Amnon's part. David probably didn't get it at the first. But chapter 10 and verse 11, God says, I'm going to raise up evil right in your own house. Here it is, folks. That's how it got there. Don't think there was just a sad set of circumstances. People get hurt because of our sin. Other people get hurt because of our sin. Not just us. When I commit a sin, I can't, I can't restrict God's um, chastening and punishment to just me. I don't have that option. God's going to work that out however He determines to work it out. And guess what? He's justified in what He does. However He chooses to do it, He's justified. So David's already lost a son over this. Now he's getting ready to lose another son. And that's after, and we're not going to study that part of it tonight, but he's getting ready to lose another son. And oh, by the way, the shame of a daughter. As she goes into desolation. But it says Amnon in verse 15. You know they always said there's such a fine line between love and hate. There's such a fine line. You can, you can marry somebody and love them for 20 years. And when you decide to get a divorce, it's hate right away. In most cases. I hate her. I hate him. And it just... I, I don't. It's it's part of our our physical nature because of the flesh that we can't control, but the Holy Spirit can assist us. Now, Amnon in verse fifteen hated her exceedingly. His lot and why did he hate her? Because his love wasn't love. His love was lust. And so after he had raped her, now she's damaged goods. And oh, by the way, she said some things to him about his reputation, about uh, his succession to the throne as a possibility. And he's probably thinking of those things now. Now that he's gone through his exercise of lust and he's fulfilled it, now he's sitting back <laughs> and now he hates her. Probably hating her because she didn't break away. I don't know. At this point, he may be hating that she didn't break away. But what one thing we do know, Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. That's what happens to so many people because their love is not love. If you haven't looked at my Facebook post lately, I didn't do it related to this, but I did a series on love. And what we think is love is not love. It's only God's love that is love. Everything else falls way short. But the hate with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone, get out of here. 
And then he says, and she said unto him, there is no cause. There's no cause for you to kick me out now. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other. It is sending her away is greater sin than the rape, she says, that thou didst to me. But he wouldn't listen to her. Why would the sending her away be greater or worse than the rape? Because it's in addition to. It's an additional part of the crime. So he boots her out. It says in verse 17, He called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. What do you think the servant's thinking now? <laughs> he probably doesn't have a clue, but he knows one thing. David's, I mean, uh, Amnon's kicking her out for some reason. In verse 18, she had, she had a garment. And the garment here is a, is a long-sleeved garment, if you will, of diverse colors upon her. And that's multiple colors, if you will, of several colors. For with such robes were the king's daughters who were virgin appareled. It was that which signified a virgin. A multicolored, long-sleeved garment uh, was that which signified, much like a wedding ring would signify a marriage, this multicolored garment signified that she was a virgin. And that's what she had on. It says, Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head. This is typically done in those days for mourning. She was extremely sad here. So she threw ashes on her head. That's what they did in those days when they mourned over something. And she was mourning heavily at this point, no doubt. And she rent her garment of the diverse colors that was on her. And this tearing of the garment symbolized, because this garment symbolized virginity. So when she tore it, that literally symbolized to everybody that she was no longer a virgin. She tore the garment. It meant she was no longer a virgin. Now having just come out of the, the chamber with Amnon, at this point... If the servant didn't know, it becomes readily apparent that what's happened here. And she laid her hand on her head. Um, and in those days, this was a sign of being banished or exiled, if you will, uh, and put into isolation. And then she went on her way crying, no doubt, because at this point, having mourned, torn the garments that symbolized her virginity, symbolizing her banishment and exile, considered herself just as good as dead. It was a horrible experience because of David's sin. Now Tamar, Amnon's done this wicked thing by raping his sister. Tamar now is desolate, literally desolate, and we see that in the next verse. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? How would he figure it out? Because she tore the garment. That's what it symbolized. She tore her garment. Amnon knows that she went over there. because David sent and asked for her. So Absalom knows that she went over there. She comes back with her garments torn. So he knows, Absalom knows that Amnon had sexual relations with her. And so he asked her, um, and after the brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? Then he goes in to say, But hold now thy peace, my sister. And you say, Well, you know, should, you know, and, and he goes on to say, He is thy brother, regard not this thing. In other words, don't, don't think so much about this thing. Don't make such a big deal of it. He's trying to save her reputation. He's trying to save her from her desolation. He's trying to ease the pain. At the same time, he's already started a plan to kill Amnon. So don't think that Absalom's trying to take up for his brother and trying to push this thing under the rug. He's trying to protect her. One of, the, one of the passages in 1 Corinthians uh, 13 says, bears all things. Literally, it means that we try to cover things up. 
And so it doesn't mean that we try to be deceptive, but you don't try to spread the bad news about it. You don't try to, to, to tell everybody in the world about it, but you try to correct the problem. And his correcting the problem is going to go kill Amnon. That's what he's going to do. It says there at the end of the verse, So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And this word desolate literally means deserted. It means deserted. That's where she was. Uh, she was isolated, dejected, depressed, sorrowful. All of those things wrapped up in one. No doubt she remained unmarried and childless being there. Who would have her at this point? Um, and we just, we just need to put it in perspective. It's not just a sad string of events. Go back to chapter 10, excuse me, go back to back chapter 12 and verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. We got it right there. <clears throat> you know, there's trouble, there's trouble, and that's where God decided to stir the trouble, right there in his family. And I'm not saying, I don't believe that's God's plan every time somebody sins, is to, is to have the family have this severe trouble. But you know what I do believe? I believe that a lot of family troubles are because of sin in somebody's life. It could be your sin, it could be my sin. I could look at my family and I need to point a finger at me. And I expect every individual in the family to point a finger at themselves. Are you the cause of the trouble in our family? Are you the cause of trouble in our family? Am I the cause of trouble in my family? And we can certainly ask ourselves that question. Because if we don't ask the question of ourselves, now we don't need to point a finger at somebody else and say, you're the trouble. It needs to be a self-examination of the heart. And say, am I the reason that there's some trouble in the family? But you know, the family's not the only place trouble comes up. Comes up in the finances, comes up in friendships, comes up in the job. Somebody gets fired from the job and say they blame their boss for being unreasonable. It was unreasonable. They had no, no sound basis for firing me. Maybe there's a sin in the life and God decided to stir some trouble there on the job. But see, we don't want to look at ourselves. We want to look at a boss and say, unreasonable. I mean, look what Amnon did. I mean, there was no indication that he was this way prior to this, prior, prior to David's sin. But after the sin, here it comes. And God uses people in various ways. There's no question about that. And we can look at this and say, well, you know, certainly God didn't orchestrate this. Read chapter 12 and verse 11. God said, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. We need to believe the Bible. That's what we need to do. And if we neglect looking at ourselves by way of self-examination for sins in our life, and say, well, I can't remember anything really bad that I did. Does it have to be really bad? List all the things that are sins. Put them in a big pile, mix them up. They're still, when you pick them out, they're still sin. Sin is sin. And we went through our study of sin in, in several weeks, three or four months worth of studies. It's transgression of the law. It's rejection of God's word. That's what sin is. Over in 1 John chapter 3, we looked at that passage. And when there's sin in our life, it doesn't matter. It could be a white lie, we call it. We want to call it a white lie because we don't see anything wrong with it. Because if it's white, it's good, right? White is representative of good. We don't say, well, it was just a little dark lie. We don't say that. Oh, it was a little black lie. Has he ever said that? No. It was a little white lie. There's a reason why we don't use the word black or dark. We say white because we don't really think it's a sin. Oh, it was just a little, just is a, is a because we usually say it that way, it was just a little white lie. Just is a word that is only a word that we use, so we exonerate ourselves from the sin. And white is something that describes it as something that's not a sin at all. So I didn't sin. It was just a little white lie. 
Sometimes we don't divulge the whole truth when we talk to somebody. And we don't divulge the whole truth because if we did, it might cause some trouble. And so we, de- we intentionally withhold information so that it doesn't turn out to be different or worse than what it would be if we were to divulge the information. So there's many different ways we can sin. Uh, and, and we just need to examine our own lives and understand, is there something in my life that I haven't confessed? David eventually confessed it. Remember we talked about confessing it doesn't mean that God's going to withhold the consequences. God will forgive the sin, but the consequences are still going to be paid. So we have to be careful to minimize the sin. That's why Paul said, God forbid that we would take, ever take the attitude that we can keep on sinning and God's grace and forgiveness is just going to keep on coming. It doesn't work that way. God's punishment and chastening is going to keep on coming if you're saved by the grace of God. It's going to come just like that. And we wonder everything just sort of falling apart. Why? Well, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. That's when we might find the right answers. Let's stand together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you, Father, for teaching us tonight from your word, which is pure, precise, and truthful in every way. What we have is inspired by you, every word. And Father, we, we take it as your word, and we believe it as your word. And, uh, and Father, tonight may we, may we be motivated and stirred within our hearts to do something about this thing called personal sin, that, Lord, we would uh, seek wherein there is sin in our life and we would confess it. And, Father, that, that our turning from that sin by way of repentance, that it would be that we would not ever want to commit that sin or any other sin again. Knowing we're not perfect, we can still grow and mature and we can sin less often, even though we're still in this body of flesh. So, Father... May we have that desire, may we have that uh, fervor, may we have that intensity uh, and passion to, to serve you righteously and in a, in a pattern of behavior that would be seen as, as pleasing in your sight. And we'll give you praise and thanks for what you'll do in our lives as we pursue that objective of pleasing you. Watch over and keep us now as we make our way throughout the remaining portion of this week. Take care of us. We know that you're able And we know that you're willing. And we thank you, Lord, in advance for that protection and for that which has already come. And Father, we just give you thanks again, uh, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.